So I'm Thomas Bitz. I'm in my second year in the PhD and I work on operating flexibility of CCS systems and few and future low carbon energy systems. Laura has already mentioned that. And that's also what I'm going to talk about to you in the next 15 minutes. So let's first look at the rationale behind CCS, where there's a conversation already, and why we need it. So, well, it's the cheapest option to uh, decarbonize the economy, and we can already, already use it in the, in the medium term, which is very important if we uh, speak about cumulative emission limits to the atmosphere. Um, especially um, uh, since that means we need less deep cuts in CO2 emissions at the end of the century, or in fact, even less negative emissions. I mean, that's why, why I think it's one of the most feasible and realistic options we can use in the battle against climate change. I usually state the IPCC and the ETI cost figures. So the IPCC suggests that without CCS in a global power mix, that will increase the mitigation cost by 138%, and that's only the increase. Um, uh, and what is also very interesting is that um, less than 50% of the de deployed climate models can in fact even reach the targets, the climate targets, if CCS is not included in the capacity mix. The Energy Technology Institute suggests that including CCS in the UK's energy system reduces the costs of reaching the desired 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 by more than 30 billion pounds a year. So having set the scene, we can now look, uh, look a bit closer at the technology and about the research that is done and the research that we need. And we can find a bit, quite big contrast there between, uh, um, or let's call it an imbalance, between most research focusing on CCS technology at steady state and on individual components along the CCS process chain, while CCS power stations and the downstream connected infrastructure will need to operate more flexibly in the future when we have increasing penetrations of intermittent renewable power on the grid. And this need for our CCS power stations and the downstream infrastructure to operate flexibly is shown consistently by electricity system modeling studies. And even the former DEC assumed a CCS capacity factor of only 58% in 2035, which underlines that. And that need to operate flexibly is even exaggerated by the limited capabilities of the nuclear plants that are very likely on the grid by in the middle of the century to operate flexibly. Nevertheless, there's only very little research done about the flexibility of CCS systems. And that is what uh, my research addresses. So that is what I'm actually doing. Um, I do this in three steps. First, I look at the requirements of CCS power stations and future low carbon power systems to operate flexibly. I do this via electricity system modeling. In the next step, I look at the constraints to flexible operation along the CCS process chain, which is basically a qualitative search for constraints, although I try to quantify where possible. And thirdly, I look at the options along the CCS process chain to balance variations in CO2 flow rates. I specifically look at a power plant here, and I do that via power plant process modeling. And what is quite nice about my project is that I can look at all the different parts of the CCS process chain. So over the electricity system where the power plants are operating in, over the power generation unit, which are basically power plants, over the carbon capture unit, compression unit, transportation system, injection system, and I look even to some extent at the storage site. And that stands in quite a bit of contrast to most CCS researchers that only look at individual components along the process chain. Um, yeah, you've just seen a slide. I'm now going to guide you through my research project by talking about the individual parts of the project consecutively. Let's start with the first one. So in the first step, I am uh, trying to find out about the operating profiles of CCS power stations and future low carbon electricity systems by electricity system modeling. And I have a unit commitment economic dispatch model for the UK power system that was developed by a former colleague, Alistair Bruce, who also does, did his PhD here in INS. Some of you might still know him. So that model is written in MATLAB, and it uses highly accurate wind data for the UK from 2002 to 2010, which was uh, prepared, provided by Sam Hawkins, who also did his PhD, I think, in IES, uh, definitely at the University of Edinburgh. 
And I use different amounts of wind power generation capacity in different scenarios. I've implemented a nuclear power capacity of 15.5 gigawatts, which is in line with DEC predictions for 2035. Uh, 72 gigawatts of gas fired capacity, and some of that capacity is equipped with CCS capability, a, a varying amount. And I look at different uh, C2 emission intensity scenarios at 50 grams, 100 grams, and 150 grams per kilowatt hour average over the fleet. The model is based on an hourly discretization. And here you can see some results of the model. Uh, although I have modeled many different scenarios, I'm now only showing the baseline scenario, really, which considers 30 gigawatts of available wind power generation capacity, 100 grams of per kilowatt hour of CO2 emission intensity, which then implies a CCS capacity of 9 gigawatts. And um, wind data and demand data is taken from 2004 as an average windy year. And you can see the, then the power generation out put off the aggregate CCS power plant fleet for the representative month of October. And you can indeed see that the CCS power stations need to operate very flexibly. And they need to ramp up and down and cycle basically on a daily basis. And you can also translate those power output profiles into time profiles of CO2 that is then captured by the CCS power plants. And that is what the chart below shows. Um, uh, and again, um, uh, these are very varying very much. The profiles are very differently, but the ones below are corrected for the part load efficiency losses of the CCS power stations. And these are then, at least in this scenario, in fact the flows that need to be accommodated by future downstream CO2 transportation storage systems. And because not only the absolute levels of flow, rate varia uh, flow rates can cause difficulties for the downstream CO2 transportation storage infrastructure. I've also looked at the uh, variations in CO2 flows. I have calculated uh, the net flow rate changes over six hour intervals over the, on a rolling basis over the base here. Um, uh, yeah, the frequency and amplitude, so how often they happen um, uh, within the year. Now one can see that 32% of the net flow changes are greater than 25% of normal flow and 18% are greater than 40% of normal flows. So that's quite a lot. So that's important to understand what is flowing into the CO2 pipelines. But because the CO2 flow, flow rate variation, variations smooth out to some extent over the pipelines, especially if they're long, it is also important to look at the longer term variations <coughs> to actually see what is arriving in a CO2 injection well and storage site. And for that, I've um, calculated uh, the frequency and the amplitude of the changes in the average amount of CO2 flows over consecutive six hour time blocks, again on a rolling basis over the base year. And still 25% of the average changes are greater than 25% of nominal flow, and 10% are greater than 40% of nominal flow. So overall you can see that the changes, the variations, um, are significant in the amplitude and happen on a very regular basis. So as a next step, I've looked at the constraints to flexible operation of the CO2 transportation storage systems. I've done that by doing an extensive literature review and also talking uh, quite a lot to the CCS feed study teams of the two CCS demonstration projects that Laura mentioned before. And uh, I came up with the summary. And you can see, basically for the transportation pipeline, booster station reservoir, most of these constraints have to do with staying within certain uh, pressure limits or respecting certain flow limits. But for the injection well, there are several other risks you have to consider when cycling regularly. And that's the risk of hydrate formation, of cracking of cement and wellbore materials, of reduced lifetimes due to cyclic thermal stresses, of hydrogen imp induced embrittlement of well material, and of oscillations and vibrations. And you can see that pretty much all of these things are at least exaggerated by the Joule-Thomson cooling effect. That effect is when fluids, for example, CO2, um, cool down upon expansion. And it can be very strong. In wells, temperatures of minus 20, minus 30 degrees can reach, which then over time can threaten the integrity of the injection wells. Um, exactly, so let's see when this actually happens. And for that, it's helpful to look at the system configuration again. 
So you have the CO2 source there, capture unit, compression unit, transportation pipeline, injection well and storage site. And we treat a pipeline in the wells, it's a wellhead choker. And that valve is quite central in the system as it is used to control the upstream pressure in the pipeline. The downstream pressure can't be controlled directly, but it's a function of the reservoir pressure, the static CO2 drop over the CO2 column in the well, and then the dynamic back pressure which develops when you inject CO2, which is a function of the load. And if the pressure upstream and downstream of the valve don't match, if there's a pressure drop, that comes along with the Joule-Thomson cooling effect. And if the pressure drop is very large, that Joule-Thomson cooling effect can get very large, and, um, especially if there's flashing happening across the valve, which is when this, five minutes, that's all right, which is when the CO2 uh, um, goes from the dense state before the valve into the gaseous state in one go. And uh, that's when the low temperatures happen predominantly. That happens particularly if uh, there are low reservoir pressures, if there are deep reservoirs or at low flow rates. And for low reservoir pressures or deep reservoirs, um, you can design the wells accordingly so that flushing is not a problem, at least in design conditions. But low flow rates or cyclic operation um, uh, does threaten the integrity of the well over time. So we have come up with some options that you can use to uh, mitigate these issues associated with those low or varying flow rates. And we figured that basically um, uh, when we balance the CO2 flows, which is basically uh, smoothing out the CO2 flow rate variations, we can ensure that the wells that are in operation are operating more often closer to the design conditions, which is good for the integrity. Um, uh, and the balancing options we came up with can be classified on happening on a power plant level and on the C2 transportation storage system level. On a power plant level, we can use solvent storage at post-combustion capture power plants, liquid oxygen storage at oxyfuel power plants, and hydrogen storage at pre-combustion power plants. Um, uh, on the transportation storage system level, we can uh, install storage tanks somewhere along the system. We can use, if we need to store bigger volumes, interim storage <coughs> and geological formations, or we can use line packing, and that's basically the easiest. As, and it is if you increase or decrease the pressures in the pipeline and use the compressibility of the fluid to pack either more or less into the pipeline, which can be used as a buffer then. And yeah, in this way, you can smooth out the flows exiting the pipeline system and going into the well. And then there are the options of enabling the wells to operate more flexibly by using sophisticated well design options or intelligent wells. The problem here is the reliability of the sophisticated systems. And uh, well designers and system designers usually like to avoid all like, um, uh, sophisticated solutions as even small issues um, uh, can lead to very expensive follow-up costs, um, uh, especially if well interventions are needed offshore. So they don't really like these options, but I think they should still be considered. And in the end, it is a matter of what is the cheapest option, which option will be, will be deployed. And the evaluation of all of these options goes beyond the scope of my project, but that raises a question what I will look at. And that is solvent storage at post-combustion ca uh, capture power plants, liquid oxygen storage at oxyfuel power plants, and line packing. And for that, I'll need to do some process modeling. So that was a small overview of our project. I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions, please ask, and thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.